So I'm not a psychologist or scientist, I'm really not even sure if I'm someone who should be making this video, but my upcoming single, All My Friends Keep Dying From Drugs, inspired me to finally start properly researching the topic of addiction. And once I started researching, I quickly realized there is so much we're not talking about. I've been listening to podcasts about the opioid crisis for the past three and a half hours, and just what the fuck? And to be completely transparent, I was actually a little ashamed when doing my research to find that even myself having lost too many friends to addiction and even have struggled with it myself, I still was holding on to some pretty harmful stigmas. And admittedly, I probably would have been still holding on to those stigmas if I hadn't had properly educated myself, which is what inspired me to make this series. And just to clarify, this isn't some anti-drug series. I actually think the whole just say no just rhetoric say no. is a bunch of bullshit. I think what we do need is more open dialogue about not only how to protect ourselves from addiction and overdose, but also how to think about it, how to talk about it, how to deal with it, how to grieve with it. So hopefully by the end of this series, we not only have started the conversation, but hopefully are left with enough knowledge to continue the conversation. Because if anything, I know my friends would have wanted that. I feel like nowadays it is mind-blowingly common to have been either directly or indirectly affected by overdose. Like even if you fortunately have not lost someone you personally know to overdose, you probably have idolized like a musician or an actress or even a sports person, I don't know sports, what do you call sports people? Uh, athlete, there we go. <laughs> so my question is, if overdose and addiction is such a widespread problem, how come we barely talk about it? I find that so nuts. Which also, speaking of nuts, I need to show you guys how I'm filming this right now. I am a professional. Anyways, I have a couple theories as to why we don't really talk about this topic. First being, well not really a theory, it's just a fact, that we are just undereducated about this. So, I thought we would first sit down with an addiction expert to find out what the fuck even addiction is. Okay. I get so nervous before interviews. <laughs> Hi! Hi! This is Dr. Nzinga Harrison. She's not only a physician who's board certified in adult psychiatry and addiction medicine, but she's also the chief medical officer and co-founder of the treatment center, Eleanor Health. She also runs a podcast called In Recovery. So in other words, she's a badass who knows her shit. Would you mind explaining to me like what defines addiction and what differentiates it from partying or drug abuse? I just use this very wide definition for addiction, which is continuing to engage in some behavior that the negative consequences outweigh the positive consequences. Mm. And to add to that, as Gabor Mate says it, addiction is any behavior that a person finds relief and therefore craves in the short term, but suffers negative consequences in the long term, yet doesn't give up despite the negative consequences. To answer the second part of your question, to draw the distinction from partying, which I hate the use of the word partying. It's way too vague. Not even it's way too vague, but it's like, we don't use, par like partying is like, I went to a party, I had a couple drinks, it was a great time, we were partying. We use partying to be like, I used all the drugs and all the alcohol and passed out and it was hardcore and I don't really know what happened yesterday, like we were partying hard. To the break of dawn, yo! <laughs> Yeah, I'm like, wait a minute, there's a little, there's something going on there. The real concept of the way we use partying is actually risky, hazardous use of alcohol and drugs. So like the before, the beginning steps. Yep. And then recreational use is like you use alcohol and drugs, they bring you benefits. You don't have negative consequences from it. So how does that turn from moderate use or recreational use into then addiction? It starts with this idea that every medical condition we have, which addiction is, has biological reasons, psychological reasons, 
social reasons, cultural reasons, political reasons, right? All of those inputs for why an illness develops. It can be purely because of biological risk because you inherit it in your DNA, just like you inherit high blood pressure risk, just like you inherit diabetes risk. Psychological risk is like you're stressed out, you're burned out, your relationship is not fulfilling, you're not quite sure what your life purpose is. All of those stressors represent danger to your brain. Mm -hmm. And then socially, isolation. Oh, great. Literally is life threatening. And then culturally, politically, less party. Like that's cultural. And then politically, it's just like you look at the systems that we've built that drive stigma, prevent people from being able to ask for help. And like all of those structures drive the worsening and continuation of an addiction once it develops. Do you think you have to have something in all of those sections to develop an addiction? Nope. No. Just one will do. Uh, raise your hand if you thought the only way you can develop an addiction is if you had it in your family tree. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, that's not true. <laughs> Oh, but goodness. most of us are dipping out of more than one of those buckets. I mean, so are there warning signs? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Cage, C-A-G-E. Yeah. If you find yourself using more than you thought, mm -hmm. if you think to yourself, should I cut down? That's C. Okay. If you feel annoyed, that's the A. When other people talk to you about your use, that's a warning sign. Ooh, yes. G, if you ever feel guilty, like, ah, oh, I said I wasn't going to blank and then I did, Yeah, that's a warning sign. E, if you open your eyes in the morning, eye opener, and you either have to use or you're thinking about using just to try to get through the day, that's a warning sign. The very, very first inkling you think to yourself, is this a problem? Reach out some way, somehow. That's what I'm learning recently, doing all this research, that harm reduction, is, harm reduction is just massive. Can you tell me like what that even means? So here's my favorite quote. It's by Monique Tula. She's the executive director of the Harm Reduction Coalition. Mm -hmm. And she says, harm reduction is unconditional love for people who use drugs. I listened to a podcast of yours and wrote down that quote in my notes. Because it's just, oh, I love it. Isn't it beautiful? Yes. Really? We hate people that get addicted to drugs. We don't hate people that use drugs because using drugs is part of our culture. Wait, let's hear that again, because that straight up blew my mind. Really? We hate people that get addicted to drugs. We don't hate people that use drugs because using drugs is part of our culture. That's such a good point. And so harm reduction means even while a person is using drugs, we want to reduce the harm that can come to you from that active addiction. So just because you're using drugs, I don't want you to die from an overdose. Narcan, fentanyl strips, clean needles, the very nucleus of it is like, you don't have to stop using drugs for me to value you being alive and for me to want to help reduce harm that this illness can bring to you. Yeah, that's what I'm also learning. That seems like compassion is the number one thing we're lacking when it comes to this illness. And it's crazy, right, Cammy? Because yeah. when you are sick, do you need people to be mean to you and say, I told you so and make better decisions? Why is it that we have so much compassion when someone has any other illness, but this one specifically, why do we want to turn a blind eye? If you take mental health medical conditions versus physical health, medical conditions. It's very easy for us to separate physical symptoms from who the person is. It's like you have cancer, you're not cancer. But when you have a mental health condition and the symptoms are the way you think, the way you behave, the way you interact with other people, then it's hard, the decisions you make, the behaviors you have, right? Then it's hard for people to divorce symptoms from who you are. And so you think you hate the person, yeah. when in reality you hate the addiction. If I have addiction, that is so incredibly painful to the people around me. And you don't, it's not easy to respond to pain with compassion. You have to be able to be livid and angry and hateful against addiction without being livid and angry and hateful against you. It would help for people to recognize that it truly is an illness, right? So what makes it an illness? 
Uh, one, it starts in the brain. We'll get more into the neuroscience of this a little bit later. Two pieces of evidence that I use for people that this is truly an illness is one, you see how devastating addiction is. Who would choose it? Two, addictive disorders are actually more coded in your DNA than high blood pressure and type two diabetes. Whoa. You look at relapse rates of addiction, this blows people's mind. Relapse rates of addiction are the same and sometimes better than asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure. It sounds like a lot of issues when it comes to addiction all stem from stigma. What do you think like is the first steps of at least on an individual level, getting rid of that. Always compassion. Compassion is always the first step. And I think um, it's exactly what you're doing here, Cami. It's an understanding. How do you think we act on reducing overdose, especially in teens? So, I mean, the right now answer is fentanyl strips yes. and Narcan kits for everybody. So I was thinking about it and another theory that I have as to why we don't talk about addiction enough is maybe because we think it's fun, which may sound stupid, but think about any scene you've seen from a TV show or a movie where it depicts being on drugs. It's almost always fun, pleasurable, sexy, euphoria. Enough of this shit will make you invincible, able to conquer the world and eviscerate your enemies. And yeah, maybe the first time or the first couple times you use a drug, maybe there's an ounce of truth in there. But when it comes to addiction, that is not the case. Let me explain. So if we used opiates as an example, they play on the dopamine receptors. Dopamine makes you feel good. The brain only releases dopamine if there's something good happening. So it tells the brain that it should go back to that thing. And you might be thinking, well, doesn't this sound like a good thing, Cammie? No. Because then said brain is like, what the fuck? Why is there so much dopamine inside of me? Brain says, less dopamine receptors for you. And guess what? Like we said, dopamine equals feel good. So if you have less dopamine receptors, that means you don't feel good. And you might think, Cammie, doesn't this only happen while I'm on the drugs? No. Even when you're not on the drugs, you still have less dopamine receptors. Definitely just spelled receptors wrong. Then because you have less dopamine receptors, that means you're not able to feel pleasure as much, even if you are not on the drug. But even when you're on the drug, that means you still don't feel good. And you need more of the drug to feel even slightly okay. That means literally the drug is affecting your biochemistry. It is literally changing the brain, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Moral of the story, addiction is not fun. Did you get all that? Well, if you didn't and you're still a little bit confused, first of all, I don't blame you. This is a lot and I'm not a scientist, but I know someone who is, so let's go talk to her. Hi, Cami. This is Professor Judy Grizzle. She's a behavioral neuroscientist with an expertise in pharmacology and genetics. Her whole research is focused on determining the root cause of drug addiction. She even wrote a full book about it called Never Enough, which is the reason why I got in contact with Judy, because the book blew my mind. Oh, and you know what also blew my mind? Is that Judy also used to be an addict. I first wanted to talk about your story. I'll start at the end. I just want to say that I think scientists and addicts have a lot in common. They're both Ooh. driven by a strong desire to explore the edges of things. So I took my first good drink at just about 13, just to make a long story short, not turning down a single opportunity to take any mind altering substance mm -hmm. for the next 10 years. I probably hit bottom so quickly right around my 23rd birthday because of cocaine. And I was injecting drugs. I contracted hepatitis C. I was homeless. I had been at this point kicked out of three schools and I ended up in treatment. When I was there, they said, you have a disease that's killing you. And if you want to live, you're going to have to quit. And I thought, 
no way. <laughs> so I figured I was going to outsmart him. I'll solve it. And that's how I became a neuroscientist. I think that I was as determined in my drug use as I was in my graduate school. You know, that kind of persistence is something that's sort of characteristic of addicts or people who have substance use disorders, but it also can be useful in other context. That is such a cool perspective of actually putting not a positive spin on addiction, but that mentality that it could be put in a more healthier route. I think that's one of the big lessons I've learned. I told myself, okay, I'm just going to stay clean for seven years. That's how long it's going to take me to solve it. That's a long time <laughs> still. It did seem long, right? But I figured, okay, I'll only be 30 and you know, my life won't be totally over. But uh, it was, my life was so much better. And that's the another thing that surprises me. I just couldn't see how miserable I was. One thing I was thinking is I think people don't understand how not fun addiction is. And when I was reading your book about tachyphylaxis and the B process, that's what really stuck out to me. So could you explain a little bit of tachyphylaxis? So it turns out that our brain is an amazing organ, the most for sure amazing organ. Its most amazing attribute is its ability to adapt to change. Neuroplasticity, meaning our brains are pliable and plastic and can grow, adapt and change. Most people, you're right, don't recognize this, is that it's got a stable baseline. So like if I bumped into you, Cami, the, you know, on the street and I said, how are you? And you said, oh, I'm fine. That would probably mean that nothing fabulous and nothing terrible was going on. You just felt like your normal neutral self. That normal neutral self is a product of your brain, making it clear when something good or bad happens because you're always able to compare your neutral self to what's ever going on. But that center space, that homeostasis or that internal stable state is critical. Yeah. Well, when we find addictive drugs, their very uh, nature is to make us, you know, feel great. The problem is that the brain is more clever uh, than that. This is a chart of tachyphylaxis from Judy's book. And so as, you know, I tried to take drugs to inflate, the brain adapts to kind of bring that back down. And this is the basis of addiction. So that, you know, at the core, anything you take a drug to do, your brain produces the opposite effect in order to bring you back to normal. Opiate addicts, it's, it's such a sad thing because at first, opiates are like perfect and then they get okay and then the main reason for using opiates is that you feel terrible without them the brain adapts so that the only way to feel normal is to use the drug which makes you a great customer but also a slave so that actual b process creates the withdrawal and physical dependency yes and and also tolerance and also craving the drug um, changes you from neutral to a positive state. The brain, in order to maintain neutral, produces a negative state. And that negative state combined with a positive state makes you tolerant because now the drug doesn't work quite as well because your brain is counteracting it. But it also makes you dependent and withdrawing. And I was there. I, I felt like if I didn't smoke weed, Mm -hmm. I was, not only was my stomach all upset, but I was bored out of my mind. And that's because marijuana um, is interesting acutely and it makes things really rich and colorful. So now uh, my brain is sort of overloaded with that, which makes it produce kind of a state of boredom. The counteract. so counteracting, keeping me the same so that I could tell if something really important happens. And then uh, I take the marijuana away. And I mean, it was bleak. Two, three, four months, the B process, this process that we're talking about that counteracts the effects of the drugs starts to dissipate because my brain realizes, wait a minute, she's not loaded all the time. So I don't have to create this opposite state. Suddenly things get uh, worthwhile again. Thank God for neuroplasticity. I feel like yes. it always goes back to that. That should yeah. be a bumper sticker, huh? Right? Oh, seriously, let's put that on a t-shirt. One in four people less than 18 right now is depressed and mm -hmm. one in five is anxious. This means it's statistically normal to be depressed or anxious. And it's natural, I think, to want to 
Medicaid cut. But the thing we're talking about, this B process, means that if you do that regularly, you actually become more depressed and anxious. So with the B process, does it get more intense the more of the drug that you use? Absolutely. So this is the miraculous thing about the brain. There's no limit to its ability to adapt. Okay. So this is a chart of tachyphylaxis once you enter tolerance or addiction. If you're an opiate addict, let's say, you can't get enough drug to get high because your brain is so great at tamping that down. So then you die of an overdose because you're just trying to get to this very narrow ledge where you're not quite dead and you're not in withdrawal. Uh, I just gotta say to that, holy shit. So that would mean if you're struggling with addiction, you're not even probably getting high at all. You're literally just trying to feel normal with the drugs. Right. Yeah. When I was using I my favorite and I used everything I could get, but I loved weed mm -hmm. and I smoked all day long. You know, the first hit or so was kind of nice, but the main reason I smoked it because I couldn't face the day without it. It makes me think of like a hamster on a wheel, just constantly trying to chase that first yes. high and you'll never get it again. You're exactly right. It reminds me of a quote in your book where you said, I'm not against drugs. I'm against addiction because addiction is what takes away the freedom. But then it's a slippery slope of knowing if you're going to end up in addiction. So, but basically anybody could become addicted at any time if they use enough. The single biggest thing you could do mm -hmm. is don't get high, you know, with anything until you're at least 21, but maybe 24, 25. Your chances then are dramatically reduced. What I tried to say to my own kids is, look, then you could enjoy it. To me, that seems like great. I don't know if it would have compelled me or not, but like... Geez, that's a gift. I wanted to read a quote from your book. I really loved this book. That's why I'm quoting it so much. But a victim of virtually any disease usually elicits pity. Addicts mostly evoke revulsion. What is it about the irrational behavior of an addict that makes everyone want to turn away? So I think people look away because they don't want to look at their own um, behavior. And we don't have a lot of models, Cammie, for, for showing up. You know, the, the people who are actually present are few and far between, you know? There's a million ways to escape. That's what I was worried when I was thinking about why we don't talk about this more, is like the cognitive dissonance of just not wanting to actually look at it, which hopefully that changes soon. What we really need is just more seeing each other. Mm -hmm. Not seeing the personas, not seeing the posts, but yeah. really seeing the humanity in each other. When I was at my worst, if I think about it right now, it's hard to look at somebody like that. My father, of all people, who is kind of a Mr. Critic, yeah. uh, he he did love me more than he criticized me. And that was the, the saving grace there, really was. Oh, that's a good line. Having that balance of like, you can be upset or not accepting of someone's actions, but still have that compassion and, and love for them. Yeah. Is there anything that you want to say to like the younger generation about addiction? So I know that drugs might seem like a solution right now. And I know there's a lot of reasons to want to find a solution because it's tough, but they're, they're, it turns out they're a dead end. This is not a solution. Why, hello there. I wanted to do just a little bit of recap for this video as uh, that was a lot. I think what stood out most to me selfishly as someone who has desperately tried to outsmart addiction many times is the fact that you can't outsmart addiction. As we learned, there is biochemical, psychological factors that make it impossible to outsmart addiction. Unfortunately. I also love what Nzinga said about how if we just look at addiction, who would want to choose it? That in itself is such great evidence of the fact that it is truly an illness. And the fact, as we talked with Judy, how it affects our brain chemistry so much. Just like Parkinson's, just like Alzheimer's. Like, can we just talk about how fucked up and unfair it is that the original reason for going to a drug most of the time is to have fun or to escape. Like you're hurting, you're wanting to escape that. But eventually, potentially, if you get addicted and mentally and physically dependent on it, not only do you not get to escape anymore, because like we talked about with Judy, the brain always trying to go back to homeostasis so you don't even get high anymore, but also it literally makes your reality 
feel worse. So the drug's effects on the brain literally convinces you to go back to the drug, even though the drug is harming you. Oh my God, it literally sounds like a parasite. But that is a disease on the brain. I also used to think that the only way you can get addicted is if you have addiction in your family tree. But as we learned with Nzinga, that's just not true. There's biological, psychological, social, political, and cultural factors. And you only need one really to potentially get addicted. Great. Sorry, I'm yelling. I get really riled up with this topic. <laughs> and that is exactly why it's so important that we try to cultivate more compassion with this topic. Because I think we desperately are missing a safe space when it comes to talking about this. Like imagine if you did meet any of the cage criteria that Nzinga was talking about. She followed up saying, if you meet any of this, immediately reach out to someone. But we need more of those safe spaces that it feels safe to actually reach out to someone and be like, hey, I think I'm struggling with this illness. What do I do? But instead the topic of addiction, I don't know about you guys, but to me it feels so hush hush, demonized and stigmatized. And like I said in the beginning of this video, I wouldn't have gotten rid of my own stigmas I was holding until I educated myself. So I totally agree with Nzinga that she said that the first thing that we need to do is try to understand this illness more and then thus hold more compassion. Which of course is harder said than done because addiction does bring pain to everyone involved, but I do think it is possible. And I think a very important thing we touched on is the importance of harm reduction. In episode three, we're gonna go really into detail about fentanyl testing strips and Narcan, which are really crucial forms of harm reduction nowadays. Anyways, if you watch this whole thing, thank you. I appreciate you and I hope you learned a thing or two. Uh, let me know in the comments what you think, if you have anything to add, because like I said, I think we just need to talk about this topic more, all in all. And I totally recognize how intense this topic is. I totally get it, but overdose rates are just going up and up. And like I say in my upcoming song, all my friends keep dying from drugs, and I really would love that to change. But I have faith that we can actually make a change. And I guess we never learn enough is enough and i can't stop thinking of